Um, our next speaker, Arn Ra, from Texas, is the Texas State Director of American Atheist. Yay! <laughs> I really respect a lot of the work that Aaron does because for one thing he has worked to maintain science standards in the Texas uh, textbooks which we all know that those are important and we have to fight a lot of people to keep those going. He's also um, ho hosts the Ramen podcast which is awesome. You guys hear that? Uh, the Ramen podcast. Yeah! There you go. And also, um, you, you write this, the uh, Living Science Classroom Supplement, is, is that correct? Okay. He writes the um, Living Science Classroom Supplement Series. Did I say that right? Okay. <laughs> That's something that I need to learn about because that's the first time I heard about it. Uh, he also teaches biology to middle school and high school kids, and that's really awesome. So, with no further ado, Arn Rock. Okay, Check it. I'm not hearing nothing. You're on. Am I on? You can hear me? Okay. Yeah, just to clarify, it's not that I make the video series and I teach bi biology. The video series teaches biology. Uh, there are a series of classroom supplement videos that are being used at the teacher's discretion in classrooms and also by secular homeschoolers. Uh, we do some biology lessons that uh, a lot of teachers, especially in Texas schools, won't cover. Uh, for example, the latest video that we did uh, concerned ERVs, horizontal gene transfer, and uh, endosymbiosis, things that make creationists very uncomfortable. <laughs> so, uh, I made a video a few years ago about a sort of time machine that wouldn't actually take you back in time but could see back in time. Uh, it was like an invisible remote control flying webcam called a chronodrone, which is a drone that travels back in time. You'd log into a particular website uh, where you can upload recordings and see other people's recordings flying this invisible eye around and you'd set how far back in time you want to go and then once there it would work like a, uh, like a flight simulator video game, except of course that it could stop and freeze in one place. As a matter of security, I set it up so that you couldn't see anything that happened in the last 60 years, so you wouldn't use it to spy on anyone. Uh, and everything that you would see would be readily visible to everyone else on the website. Everyone else can see what you're doing, and I think that would restrict the perverts. The purpose of that thought experiment was to ponder how would people react if events of the distant past could be confirmed this way. Now, a lot of people would say that all that was fake, but if your grandmother got on it, she would be able to confirm elements of her childhood to prove that it's real. And to make it more interesting, I set it so that the further back in time you go, the longer it takes to get there. So I set it up to retroject at one year per second. And at that speed, it would take roughly over a minute to uh, disprove the Holocaust deniers and all of those people who said that Hitler was an atheist. In 10 minutes, you'd be able to see Michelangelo and maybe find out why he rendered the uh, serpent in the garden as a woman. After 20 minutes or so, you'd be able to take pictures of Muhammad. So it should maybe come with a warning, screenshot at your own risk. <laughs> in a half hour, we'd be closing in on the supposed time of Jesus. And the beautiful thing about that is, no one would be able to find him. <laughs> no matter how many people had access to this program or how long they looked, and people using this app to hunt for Robin Hood or King Arthur would find themselves in a similar situation. And I'm just giving my expectations, of course, but I've heard biblical scholars comment that the New Testament period was so muddied that what little possibility there is for a historical Jesus might have been a composite of at least a few different people, none of whom could be confused with the Christ themselves or individually. But even if there was a Jesus, and even if they managed to find him, they wouldn't recognize him or accept that that's who he is. Some Christians had admitted to me that if Jesus existed, but he was just a man, a faith healer, and a cult leader, but nothing more than that, that they would find some way to ignore that fact and continue believing in their mythical Christ. 
And one woman told me that if she found Jesus using my hypothetical device and watched him die and watched his body rot for a week with no resurrection, she hopes that her faith would be strong enough to keep believing anyway. Of course, faith, of course, faith isn't just about uh, believing in spite of negative evidence at its most basic. Uh, it should, it's supposed to be a positive belief in lack of any evidence. So if Jesus really existed, um, and he was a human manifestation of God, and say some Christians were lucky enough to happen across a dozen guys named Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Thomas, Judas, Simon, and so on, they'd say, hey, these must be. But then Jesus, being God, who exists outside of time and is all-knowing and is thus capable of prophecy, would know that there would be invisible eyes from futuristic anachronauts. And God requests, or God demands, that we believe on faith, so he can't let us have any proof. And he would know when those secret spectators were watching and just wave his hands and say, these are not the disciples you're looking for. <laughs> If you let your computer scroll back for an hour, you would have passed the time of Moses and no one would be able to find him either. Nor would you find any population of two million Hebrew slaves living in one town at a time when the entire country only had a total population of three and a half million. And here's a fun fact. If the Hebrew slaves existed, then if we excuse all of the other people traveling with them and just focus on the 600,000 Hebrew men on foot that the Bible talks about in Exodus, that if they set off for Canaan, marching single file, each man occupying one meter of space, each one one meter ahead of next, if they followed the coastline from Ramses to the Promised Land, the first ones would get there before the last ones left. It's only about... 450 kilometers or about 280 miles. So if they walked 20 miles a day, it would take them two weeks to get there, and it's pretty hard to get lost when you're following a coastline. <laughs> but according to the story, with God's help, they wandered lost in the desert for 40 years. <laughs> How's that for divine guidance? <laughs> If you let your computer retroject for an hour and a half, you'd have passed the time of the great flood of Noah, and no one would have noticed that one year when everything was underwater. <laughs> but you would notice that the ancestors of all of our oldest civilizations were already dispersed across Asia, Australia, the Americas, and so on, all over the world. So you wouldn't need to go back and look for the flood. You'd already know that it couldn't have happened. You'd have to let your computer buffer for a month before you would see any Australopiths, and another couple of years to see the last dinosaurs, and four more years to see the first dinosaurs. It would take decades to see the dawn of life, and centuries to see the birth of our universe, but with this time machine, it would only take a couple of hours to disprove young Earth creationism, which is odd because it usually doesn't take that long even without a time machine. <laughs> Sadly, I don't think we're ever going to have a device like this, and it's too bad because there's a lot in paleontology that we're really not going to know any other way. Take, for example, Homo erectus, what we used to call Pithecanthropus, Georgicus, Java Man, or a few other names. Here we have one species of very primitive people, but with a huge amount of diversity. Whatever trivial distinctions you think they are among the so-called races of men today, they're nothing compared to the diversity in Homo erectus. They were all over Africa, southern Europe, and much of Asia in torrid and temperate climes, completely cut off from each other for hundreds of thousands of years just by the expanse of wilderness between them. Modern people were never so isolated for so long and were never able to grow that far apart morphologically and become as distinct as Homo erectus did. The visible differences between modern people can't even be detected by examining a skeleton. By comparison, Homo erectus were wildly different, not just from us, but also from themselves. There's often more variance within taxonomic groups than between them. In some cases, children, young children would be over five feet tall, and in other places, adults would never get that big. Even brain sizes varied considerably from not that much bigger than chimpanzees to overlapping the lower end of the modern human range. And remember, 
that all evolution is just superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. So the surface features change the most and the underlying foundation changes relatively slowly. That's why the skeleton of a lion and a tiger are nowhere near as different as their outer covering. And likewise, you could compare the skeletons of American colubrid snakes, but they all look the same. They might all be king snakes, but they could be a mix of corn snakes, rat snakes, bull snakes, and garter snakes. If you're just looking at the skeletons, there may be no way to know. So if Homo erectus skeletons were that different, then imagine how different the surface features must have been. What would the faces of Denisovans look like compared to Demonacy? Because they were separated for a long time, too. The range of colors was probably the same as what we have today, but there could be other features we'd never know anything about, and the type of hair that they had and how it grew might be completely novel from one group to another. As with the snakes and with the panthers, it's not just the colors and patterns that aren't shown in the skeletons, it's a behavior too. We know that Homo erectus used tools and weapons and made fires and all that, and sometimes even something to float on. We expect that when people make things like that, establishing traditions, that they tend to build a culture too. So did they? And if they did, then how do their rituals and practices compare from Indonesia to Gibraltar? Without a time machine, I don't think we'll ever know. That's what drives science though, trying to find out the way the things are, the way they were, and the way it really works. If that is your goal, then you want to make sure that your information is accurate, and if it's not, and it doesn't matter how much you liked that old urban legend or fictional factoid you once bought into, you will discard it and be embarrassed by it, seeking instead for truth. And it seems like every religion claims that theirs is the absolute truth, but they're using a different definition than I am. I don't mean truth in the same arrogant way that they do. I mean it in a much more arrogant way. <laughs> Because I'm not just supporting, I'm not, I'm, just, I'm not just asserting unsupported assumptions as fact and pretending to know things no one even can know. I'm talking about what I can show that I know and prove to be true, and that's a claim they can't make. Truth is generally defined as that which is concordant with reality, but that definition never applies to religion. I've said that there's no such thing as absolute truth because everything that men know is either incomplete knowledge or only true to a degree. Religionists argue that what they call creation, and I call reality, is absolute truth, but no, reality itself is not truth. But statements about reality can be, if they're true. So if we have to determine whether it is true before we call it truth, then the truth is whatever statement can be shown to be true. And that's simple enough and makes perfect sense, but it sure pisses off religious people because it means there is no truth in their religion. There really isn't. And worse than that, as I always say, it is dishonest to assert as fact that which is not evidently true, yet that's what all religions do. That is tantamount to lying. I can cite a few examples to prove that, but suffice it to say that calling something a fact when it is not a fact is a lie. There is a colloquialism in the South that whenever someone pretends to know things they don't know or professes things that can't be verified, we say that he is telling stories. In the South, that's the polite way of saying he's lying. I don't know why they don't turn that logic onto the podium on Sundays, because that's what the minister is doing, too. And some children asked me once why I don't go to church. I said, it's because I don't like to be lied to. All religions lie. That's almost all they do, and it's the biggest failing they all have. Now remember that a lie is misinformation or information misrepresented with deliberate intent to deceive. And that is the goal of religion. That's why they claim to know things they don't know and say things are facts that are not facts. Because within the deeply religious mindset, whether you believe it matters more than whether it is true. And obviously I'm talking about the more fundamentalist aspect here. For example, many times I've heard people protest whenever whatever fact I present conflicts with their religious beliefs. They say, why can't I believe what I want to believe after they already know that it's not true? They complain that whenever I tell the truth, things that I can pr prove definitely are correct, they say that I'm hurting people. People who just want to keep on believing things even when they know it's not true and can't be. 
Instead of saying they have a right to believe whatever they want, which is correct, one believer defended his position by saying he has a right to be wrong. And I don't think he misspoke. I think that's what he meant to say. You all remember when uh, Ken Ham debated Bill Nye, or tried to debate Bill Nye? In the Q&A that followed, both men were asked, what would change your mind? And of course, Bill Nye said that evidence would change his mind, while Ken Ham said that nothing would ever convince him that he's wrong. He also said that he must reject physical evidence because of some irrational obligation to ancient folklore. His ministry, like every other creationist organization, posts a statement of faith which all state in one way or another that the Bible is the only source of truth in our world so that physical evidence must be rejected in favor of fables. Some of these faith statements also imply that the world, meaning the real world that we all live in, is a lie. So in one sense or another, if religion is right, reality has to be wrong. The best demonstration of that is a documentary called Questioning Darwin uh, that interviewed a bunch of creationists and one of them confessed that if the Bible said that 2 plus 2 equals 5, that he wouldn't question that, that he would find some way to believe it. And in the Scopes Monkey Trial, William Jennings Bryan said something similar. He said, if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I would believe it. So you can see we're not talking about what you can show to be true. We're talking about believing things you know aren't true and can't be. It's literally make-believe, where facts be damned and truth is irrelevant. I have a serious philosophical objection to assertions like this. In my perspective, accuracy and accountability are paramount. Truth matters more than whatever we would rather believe. So it should be that we would never say that something is true until or unless we can show that it is or give good reasons to indicate that. And I often say that there are those with a deep-seated emotional need to believe and then there are those with have an intellectual curiosity and a desire to understand. If you just need to believe, you'll find a way to convince yourself even if that requires self-deception. But if you want to understand, you need to reject faith. Because faith is auto-deceptive and because it's important to know whether your information and interpretations are correct. That's why we're so suspicious when believers claim to witness things they've never really seen or profess improbable testimony that can't be verified. The reason that we trust the scientific method is the very reason we can't trust the improbable claims of religious devotees or doctrine. And I try to explain this to religious people all the time and they just don't get it. The only value any claim can have is in how accurate you can show it to be. If you can't show that it's true at all, it has no value at all. It is just an empty assertion, unworthy of consideration. Come back when you can show me there's some truth in it. If there's evidence against it, then there's something wrong with it, and it should be treated as though it is at least partially or probably wrong. And for example, what would happen if we devised my time machine and we found Adam and Eve talking to a snake? I would have to change my mind. Um, but I think even believers already know we'd never see that. If we had a time machine like a TARDIS where me and some young earth creationists could step inside and shoot back to a million years ago, I think the young earth creationists would refuse to take that trip <laughs> because he doesn't want to be proven wrong and he already knows that's what will happen. Uh, I've been told that whenever my arguments seem to make sense. It is only because the devil is speaking through me and he is the Lord of lies. <laughs> Any excuse will do if you're invested in pretending and some unwelcome asshole like me keeps lifting the wool off of your eyes to let the light in and force you to see things you don't want to know about. And I like the way that Tim Minchin put it. He said that science adjusts its beliefs based on what's observed. Faith is a denial of observation so that beliefs can be preserved. And these two philosophies are polar opposites. And stepping into a time machine face, means facing a reality that would be impossible to deny. And now imagine some religious, ex religious extremist trying to bluff me, saying that my time machine would disprove evolution and prove creationism. Okay, let's jump in and find out. But we both already know that's not going to happen. So maybe we have some Christian who sincerely believes that we'll both see Jesus resurrected. Okay, let's go. 
Now, if I see any of the miracles in the Bible confirmed, I will be confused. And if my time machine confirms that Christianity or Islam are true, I will be disappointed because that's about the worst scenario I could imagine. <laughs> Unless creationism were true too, because that would mean that evidence doesn't mean anything and thus the universe would be rendered meaningless. It would also be senseless, but I wouldn't be afraid to find that out. And if it turned out that I was wrong all along, I wouldn't cover that up and I certainly wouldn't lie about it. Someone associated with the Texas Board of Education once told me that he knew that there were transitional species in the fossil record, but that he wanted to teach students that there were none because he said it was important that they believe there are none. A lot of these people don't really believe what they pretend to believe. They just believe in belief. Uh, many times people are religious believers have told me that they believe what they do not because they think it's true, but because they think there's some value in believing it or because of some imagined consequence of disbelief. And often enough, apologists say that even if it's not true, we'd be better off if we believed it anyway. I've also heard believers say, why would I want to believe what you believe? That means I'm just an animal, a walking bag of chemicals, that life has no meaning, no reason to keep breathing. No reason to prolong life or ease suffering because we're all going to die eventually anyway. We just didn't matter, man. We're just, <laughs> we're just postponing the inevitable. Everything is meaningless if it doesn't matter forever, if I'm not important a billion years from now. But if I believe in God, then my life has a purpose and I can live forever in heaven. And I'm sure these people don't mean to leave this impression, but they've convinced me that they don't really believe what they pretend to believe, that they are only pretending. And I think a lot of people are like that, and I found another way to uh, demonstrate it. Some people say that they can prove that God exists, and even after hundreds of failed attempts, I still humor them. All they ever do is the logical fallacy of the circular argument routing back to the assumed conclusion as a non sequitur, or erroneously calculated mathematic probabilities which all require uh, unwarranted assumptions and a prior faith. None of their arguments ever actually indicate a God, but as I said, I hear them out and then explain why they're wrong. For the last couple decades, I've also offered to prove evolution to their satisfaction, such that by the end of our conversation, they will know that evolution is an inescapable fact of population genetics and ancestral phylogenies. They will be convinced evolutionists for the rest of their lives. They will not be able to be converted back to creationism because they will know better. They won't be able to pretend otherwise and wouldn't want to. They'll be better off for it. But that challenge is usually refused at the onset. Most creationists simply will not risk it. Those who accept the challenge freak out pretty quickly once they realize that I really can prove my point, like I said, because I don't do what they expect. I've learned that it doesn't matter what evidence you show them. They can reject it all on the excuse that that doesn't prove anything. They don't even have to understand what you said, and they try not to. They don't know why any given fact counts as evidence because they don't know what evidence is and they don't know what evolution is and everything has to adhere to their straw man distortions of it even after you've proven all that wrong. <coughs> Belief in creationism is a form of religious extremism which requires both a misunderstanding of science and a denial of reality. For example, I told Ray Comfort that his only strength was his inability to understand simple concepts. <laughs> Since I'm trying to educate someone determined not to learn, then I can't just tell them things that they're pre-programmed to reject. I have to engage them to get them to think about this, to teach them the real terms, and make sure that they understand what we're talking about and agree on what would be acceptable answers and why. That means we have to do a few rounds of Q&A and they'll be expected to acknowledge certain points as we progress to confirm that they are learning. I can't succeed without their admission, so the onus is on me, but only as long as they participate. Usually what happens is that they default the challenge early on by ref repeatedly refusing to answer direct questions. Questions they know they dare not answer because it will compromise their preferred delusion. And it is a delusion by definition because it is a persistent false belief which will not change despite irrefutable evidence to the contrary. I 
it's an a priori conclusion which must be defended at all costs, even after it has been proven wrong, which is one more reason why faith is the most dishonest position it is possible to have. And I've been using a lot of us versus them language as if there are only two extremes. Of course, that's not the case. Most people fall somewhere in the bell curve rather than out on the extremes. And these two philosophies do exist. It's just a matter of how much of both anyone embraces and in what applications. When we're talking about creationists, there really are only two types, deceivers and the deceived. And many of the, the deceived are happy to be that way and refuse to be reasoned with, but that's not true of everyone. Most reject the more repugnant or indefensible dogmas while still holding on to some core belief. Uh, many believers will proudly describe themselves as reasonable or rational based on how little of their religion they still embrace versus how much they now reject. And I think it's funny when people realize or, you know, that, that the less you believe, the more reasonable you are, but they stop before they reach the logical conclusion. They still cling to some piece of it and won't let it go. But it is possible to reach some believers. Most of them, in fact, believe what they do for what they think are justifiable reasons, and if you show them otherwise, they will change their mind. That's why Christianity is in a general state of decline, while atheism is the fastest growing demographic. Not everyone as is, is as deliberately deceived or uh, deluded or unreasonable as Ken Ham and Ray Comfort. But they're both running multi-million dollar rackets, and of course that means they wouldn't be convinced even by a time machine. Which is too bad, because Ken Ham's favorite way of questioning what he says is, uh, what he describes as historical science is by asking the question, were you there? <laughs> and wouldn't it be great to answer that question? Yes, Ken, I was. And that's one more way that I know that you're wrong. <laughs> so what would you do if you had a time machine or got shot back in time to the dawn of civilization? And maybe it happened by accident, so you weren't able to pack any cool things to show people, but you're, there, you're stuck there long enough to learn the language. What would you tell these people? And I've asked this of a lot of people online. And the serious answers, the good ones, tend to be the very opposite of most of the Ten Commandments. Uh, most of the reasonable responses, well, almost all of the reasonable responses, the serious ones that I've seen, have offered uh, better information, more useful information, and better guidelines than anything in the Bible, Old or New Testament. And most just corrected the absurd or atrocious things the Bible said. The Bible describes everything wrong. Look at the way it describes organisms by what they do. Everything that flies is a bird, including bats. Everything that swarms is called a locust, including the four-footed ones, which would be bats again. That's why it says that whales are fish. There's a taxonomic category for creeping things. What the Bible says about genetics is that if cattle have sex while looking at striped sticks, they'll give birth to striped cats. It says that the earth was once the only thing in the universe because it was the first thing ever created. And that everything else, including the sun, orbits around our world. But it never mentioned microbes, nor does it properly explain the simple practices to prevent or defend against infectious diseases. Defenders of the faith brag about ancient wisdom, saying that the Old Testament taught us how to wash our hands in running water. Yeah? And then Jesus came along and told us not to. <laughs> Because he didn't believe in pathogens. He warned us about demons instead. And besides, what child doesn't know that running water will rinse things off? Raccoons know that. <laughs> the Bible didn't tell us anything we didn't already know, and it didn't correct the things we thought we knew back then either. So what has faith ever provided for us? I was always told that God gave us all the tools that we needed. And I was a little boy when I heard that. So I said, you mean God gave Adam a hammer and a saw? <laughs> no, he gave him the wood and the trees and the minerals and the earth to make those things. You know, your computer is made entirely out of minerals that are found in the ground. So if I give you a bucket of dirt, <laughs> is that the same thing as giving you a laptop? Would you tell anybody that I gave you all the tools that you need? Now, remember, we're talking about a genie who can supposedly make everything that humans can't make, but he can't make anything humans can make. <laughs> so 
So he needs us to build his ark and his tabernacle and to fashion the, the robes for his priests because the priests can't do it for themselves and he's not going to do it for them because the Lord works in delirious ways. <laughs> So he didn't actually give us any of the tools that we needed and he didn't give us any useful information either. We had to build everything ourselves and we had to figure out everything ourselves and not only does scripture not help with that, it slowed us down or blocked us at every step. Once upon a time our ancestors believed that thunder, lightning and volcanoes were gods in action. That the stars and planets had human attributes. That, uh, that sickness was a curse of witchcraft and epilepsy was demonic possession. All because that's what religion would have us believe. In each case, the real truth might never have been discovered if we'd been satisfied by those lies. And in each case, the reality was a revolution of whole new fields of study, a revelation of whole new fields of study previously unimagined and way more complex than the simple excuses we made up in our ignorance. No doubt that pattern will continue, such as if we ever do discover the catalyst for the Big Bang or some better explanation for the origin of life, the universe, and everything. It, too, will be a wealth of new information with practical application and so advanced that it will render our previous beliefs in God's ghosts and magic just as laughably silly as every other field of study so far has already done. Our religions have given us no useful information, no philosophy of epistemology or science such as would have made everyone's lives better. So if creationism was true, then we were left to suffer in our ignorance for thousands of years while pretending to have divine guidance. Our religion taught us no moral lessons either, nothing about how to resolve conflicts with compassion, civility, and wisdom. All religion taught us was how to hate each other, how to be gullible fools, and how to fulfill our caste without question like obedient minions. For all its glorified fables and fairy tales about how it began, it couldn't get that right either. Neil deGrasse Tyson said that humanity was like a child left abandoned on the world's doorstep with no idea of its origins and ancestry. Genesis is a collection of bedtime stories blind superstitious speculation that has been proven wrong in every testable claim that it makes. Yet, Ken Ham says that if we want to believe in creation, or excuse me, if you believe in salvation, which is the second half of the Bible, then you have to make yourself believe in creation, which is the first half of the Bible. Again, it's all pretend. He doesn't believe it because it's true. It's not. He believes it because of a consequence of disbelief. He's afraid of death. That's, what, that's why religion was invented. Whatever you believe about your origins is irrelevant. It's all about death. Every religion universally accepted as such is a faith-based belief system holding the notion that some essence of self somehow transcends the death of the physical body to continue on forever in some other form. All religion assumes an eternal spirit of one sort or another. And according to one of Ted Nugent's songs, <laughs> Some people say, you got to die someday. I got news, you never got to go. Yeah, you do. Everybody dies. <laughs> Jesus said that whosoever liveth and believeth in me will never die. But whatever you want to pretend happens after death, you may still find yourself writhing on the floor, clutching your chest in agony, straining to gasp that last breath. No religion saves us from that, and that's the only part of death I'd rather avoid. Mark Twain said, I'm not afraid of death. I had been dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and had not suffered the slightest inconvenience from it. <laughs> Being dead isn't scary. It's how you get dead. And some people think this is gross, but one of the reasons I, I give as an excuse, one of the reasons that I ride a motorcycle is because I have a much better chance of having a sudden death from a healthy state. <laughs> I've seen some of the options. I prefer that. And religion tries to soften the blow by pretending that you'll live on after death. But dying is still an inescapable reality that not even faith can deny. That's why faith healers can't cure amputees either. All they can do are the illusions of delusion while the grim reality remains. It doesn't matter what religion you are or how strong your faith is. When your loved ones die, nothing is going to bring them back. When you die, 
all that you are will be reduced to a few dozen pounds of ape meat going bad. You won't be remembered forever because everyone who knew anyone will die out eventually. Whatever you've built or been a part of will collapse and decompose. Every species will become extinct, including our own. I just hope we're not the last sentient animals on this planet. But there will come a time when there is nothing left alive. Finally, in the vast expanse of time, billions of years after our own demise, everything that is will do the ultimate fade to black, which is the cosmic heat death. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will have been discarded and long forgotten way before then. So what is the meaning of life? That's a stupid question. There isn't one. Not inherently, anyway. But in the absence of that, and without karma granting any justice either, on a, trapped on a lonely spinning pebble in an inhospitable abyss which clearly was not created with humanity in mind, it seems to me that life is that much more precious. Yes, we're animals, but we're social animals, capable of comprehension and wonder, who need to share compassion to make the most of this momentary existence because that is all we have. The only meaning your life will ever have is what your involvement means to someone else. When I was a little boy, my mother took me to Griffith Park Observatory in Los Angeles they had this huge dome screen like an IMAX theater. And they showed me how our species would die out before the Earth became barren, before the sun went nova, before the galaxy blinked out of existence. And I wept, not for myself, not even so much for future generations not yet born, but for future species which might evolve too late or not at all thanks to our current loss of biodiversity. We're in a mass extinction right now called the Anthropocene because we are killing off everything at an alarming rate. We've been doing it for thousands of years. We're just a lot more efficient at it now. In the 1990s, the Alaskan fishing industry realized that they were sending out more and more ships every year, but collectively, those ships were bringing in less fish. That's scary. And then there's pollution. Our atmosphere was created by microbes generating oxygen at a much slower rate than our cars, jets, and industries are destroying it now. Combine that with deforestation and the math isn't hard to work out. My grandmother was born in the year 1900 when the world first noticed a population explosion, a result of vaccinations, which was another advance religion tries to ruin. By the time she was 90, the global population had doubled and doubled again. And I remember when we crossed six billion and the number of people alive then exceeded the number of people who had ever lived. And that must have confused those people who believe in past lives. <laughs> now we're over 7.3 billion and climbing at an exponential rate. That means that how we use our resources to generate energy, transport ourselves, and supply our food had better get really efficient. To borrow a quote from a current movie, we're going to have to science the shit out of this. <laughs> but we're not even trying, because too many of us can't admit that it's even happening, or that it's our fault, because that means we have to do something about it. We have to stop what we're doing and do something else, and nobody wants to do that. And the people who should be doing the most won't because they can't see beyond the next fiscal quarter. These are the people we elected, so if you're looking for an answer to that situation, there you go. The first time I ever argued environmentalism with Christians, they told me that we need to have as many babies as possible because we need to bring more souls to the Lord. And God gave us this planet and he expects us to use it up before he comes back. I said, okay, so if I'm right, then if Jesus comes back, he will, for no good reason, destroy a functional world where everyone has enough food and resources to live comfortably. But if we pretend that you're right, then Jesus will only save us from our own myopic foolishness when he finds billions of us starving on a barren wasteland. So what if you're wrong? I'm not wrong. Well, of course you are, but I'm not wrong. We're only talking hypothetically. I'm not wrong. Assertions of complete confidence and conviction are for some people more compelling than any facts 
supporting your case. Such a person cannot admit they're wrong, especially when we're talking about the environment because the stakes are too high. Superstition works the same way in religion as it does in gambling. The more desperate you are, the more you need to believe something else. Some people even put themselves in a desperate situation so that they have to believe, so that they have no option. Because if you're absolutely convinced and believe completely without any doubt, then your wish will come true. You just got to believe hard enough. And some of the faithful actually think like that. And we saw some of that behavior back in 2011 when Harold Camping convinced so many people that the world was about to end. Religion is a denial of reality and of responsibility. You don't actually have to help anyone. You can just wish upon a star that they'll get the help that they need magically somehow. You don't have to compensate or correct any of the wrongs that you've done because you can just pretend that your magic imaginary friend has forgiven you for whatever you should have atoned for so you don't have to be accountable to anyone or responsible for your actions. You can live like there's no tomorrow, literally. Because these are the last days and the world will be destroyed soon anyway. And that's becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. I saw the effects of overpopulation on the environment when I was a little boy. And innocently I said, well, maybe people shouldn't have so many babies. And the immediate response to my perfectly logical argument was one of horror. The very idea that everyone should consider responsible reproduction was an amoral suggestion of inhuman eugenics. I was reprimanded and reminded that the Bible told us to be fruitful and multiply, to dominate and subdue the earth. Well, we've done that. We followed the scriptures even against all reason. And now, reason tells us it's time to stop. Thank you so much. One day, the sun is going to die. For us it means no more sunsets To the universe just one less star in the sky And almost all who ever lived Have already died Count the stories of love and war And hope and pain Now side and play side by side Yes, I understand that my whole life is just a blink of an eye The history of the earth is with each moment that goes by But this moment 